Good evening, I'm Asha Tomlinson. Andrew and Adrian are away. Tonight, the Omicron wave is crashing down on Canada and we're not even getting the full picture. Our testing capacity is near its maximum. They're going to look at these huge lineups and say, I'm not going to get tested. Shattered records, long lineups, and for those who do get swabbed, a backlog at the lab. All she saw was a sea of boxes. And in those boxes are PCR tests that have to be processed. Plus, what some provinces are doing to get ahead of staffing shortages. Also tonight, a sneak peek at the $10 billion telescope about to blast off. We're building the most complex machine ever built by humanity. Meet the Canadians with their eyes on the skies. And the teacher who could take NBA players to school. We've got the story behind this epic shot. This is The National. With Christmas just days away, COVID-19 continues to push Canada into new territory as it spreads faster than ever before with numbers never seen before. Canada has now broken its own record for new COVID-19 cases for five straight days, with today's count blasting past 20,000 for the first time ever. Ontario, Quebec and BC shattered their previous highs as well, with several other provinces setting new records. And as Canadians endure long lineups just to be tested, new signs that cases are in fact much higher than the official numbers indicate. On their own, those numbers are alarming, since there's still so much we don't know about Omicron and what it means for Canada. But as Marina von Stackelberg shows us, even more alarming is how many cases we're missing. Bumper to bumper in Vancouver, people line up to get a COVID-19 swab. The same in Winnipeg, where some wait five hours to try to get a PCR test and find out if they have COVID-19. Runny nose, sore throat, I work in healthcare, so, you know, vulnerable people, so I'd rather make sure I'm safe before I go back to working with them. Manitoba now says the demand for PCR tests is so high, it's reached the limit of how many it can do. Results are backlogged by at least four days. And across the country, as infections rise, the delays could get worse. You have a lot of contacts that need to get tested for COVID, and yet we don't have the supply to actually, do it, to actually test them. In some provinces, the number of tests coming back positive is higher than ever before. In Ontario, it's up to a record 16%. In Quebec, it's even higher. All of this means that the numbers we're seeing today are not an accurate reflection of what happened yesterday, and they're going to increasingly underestimate the number of cases. Labs are already struggling to keep up with the demand. There is a medical lab technologist that said she arrived to work the other day, and she walked into the lab, and the entire lab is just filled with boxes and boxes and boxes. She said all she saw was, seas, was a sea of boxes, and in those boxes are PCR tests that have to be processed. While the demand for more accurate PCR tests grows, some governments are asking people to take more accessible antigen tests instead. But that could mean an even cloudier view of how many infections there are, since not every jurisdiction offers a way to log a positive result. That's if people can even get their hands on them. We tried on the weekend, but before we even got there, they, uh, the tests were out. We know a lot of people right now who are either have the cold, the flu, or COVID. Um, a lot of sick family members. Hopefully we get one. Uh, I understand if supply is limited. Marina, with tests in high demand and the backlogs coming to labs, what are governments trying to do to deal with all of this? We heard from a number of provinces today, including Alberta, Manitoba and Quebec, that they're going to start clamping down on who can get certain tests, especially those PCRs, which are the ones that need to go to a lab. Some jurisdictions are asking people to only go for a test if they have symptoms or if they work in healthcare. We know that in Vancouver, they're going to start only giving PCR tests to people who are at the highest risk of infection. Most people in Vancouver who are going to be looking for a test are going to wind up with one of those rapid antigen tests. Those rapid antigen tests are very much still in demand here in Ontario, where people continue to line up, hoping to get their hands on one of them before the holidays. Asha. All right, thank you so much, Marina. 
The testing of health care workers is becoming more crucial to keeping hospitals staffed. So many have been swept up by isolation protocols. Some provinces are reconsidering the rules now, which would allow more of them to stay on the job. Chris O'Neill Yates has that part of the story. To get ahead of sick calls and the potential for a staffing crunch, new rules in Ontario. Healthcare workers who've been exposed to COVID will no longer have to stay off work as long as they follow a strict testing regimen. At some hospitals, it comes as welcome news as already burned out staff face more shortages. And if there's more absenteeism, you know, they're going to be asked to work more shifts, longer hours, uh, looking after more patients, which is is also a safety concern for both patients and our healthcare workers. We have, you know, frontline uh, uh, healthcare workers that are double vaccinated and triple vaccinated. So um, I, I think that that's reassuring. But not everyone agrees now is the time for such measures. I would have said, wait with this strategy, with the strategy of 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 working quarantine, right? Wait until things become even more serious. Because if not, all you are doing is just adding to it. Working beside people who uh, could possibly have COVID um, and that that's being done knowingly, what that does to their morale is it reinforces the notion that they already have, that they're not valued. In Alberta tonight, as the cases start to take off. As Omicron is spreading farther and faster than anything we've ever seen before, a new approach to lure back as many as 1,400 health care workers who are currently on unpaid leave because they're not vaccinated. Tonight, the government says they can come back if they agree to a frequent rapid testing routine. In a statement, the health minister says they're still putting patients first, writing, we need to adjust the policy to maximize capacity and avoid losing any staff if we can while still keeping patients safe. It's a balance that officials are weighing across the country right now as the Omicron surge continues to set record case numbers in most provinces. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Vancouver. Today, Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe suggested tougher COVID rules might be ahead in his province. Well, I can say that we are tracking this situation very closely and we have not ruled out some additional measures around large gathering sizes potentially being introduced in the next week. Saskatchewan's case numbers started to rise late this week. Most said people there should be concerned about Omicron, but not panicked. Meanwhile, BC is offering financial support for those impacted by its new restrictions. Relief grants will be between $1,000 and $10,000 in one-time funding that will be provided to eligible businesses. BC's COVID-19 closure relief grant is for businesses forced to shut down this week until January 18th, including gyms, fitness centers, bars, nightclubs, and event venues, with the amount of money given out determined by the number of employees. The province will start taking applications next month. Prince Edward Island is adding new restrictions after posting a record 35 COVID cases today. Effective Friday at 8 a.m., wedding and funeral receptions, wakes and visitations will no longer be permitted, with capacity limits on churches and organized gatherings as well. And in the north, Iqaluit is now under tightened restrictions after a case was found in a resident who hasn't left the city for a month, raising fears of community spread there. More Canadians than ever are catching COVID-19, but for some, letting contacts know you're sick can come with feelings of guilt. As Vicodopia explains, there are some trying to change that conversation. Alexandra Floyd says she did all the right things, masking, distancing, getting double vaccinated, but it wasn't enough against Omicron. Floyd is now at home with her partner, quarantining. The fact that I got in the first place was shocking. And then to also then give it to him was, you know, upsetting. Um, I felt really bad to, to put that on him. Despite taking every precaution, when she broke the news to contacts, she says it was hard not to feel judged. Where were you? Who were you with the last couple of days? What did you do? Who are you around? Who did you expose? You know, and I understand those questions need to be asked for sure. So I have come to terms with the fact that I will have this virus at some point. 
This scientist says the evidence is clear. Omicron is able to evade some of our best defenses. So don't blame yourself if you get it. It's incredibly contagious. And even just like I said, passing by someone breathing the same air is sufficient right now. And nobody can stop that from happening and still have a, a normal life. Still, for people testing positive, it means uncomfortable conversations. You can feel that shame when they call you. And I've been very clear telling them, listen, this this is this is par for the course. This is going to happen to all of us, and you can't feel guilty. This is just what is going to happen at the end of this pandemic. Experts in pandemic planning expect infections to spread to most of the population as viruses become endemic and hopefully less severe. And so that message needs to get out there rather than everything we did failed because it really isn't about that. It's just the rules of the game have changed and now we have to um, flex into a different approach. That still means critical efforts to limit the spread of the virus to protect the healthcare system and those most vulnerable to a bad outcome. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Let's pick up on some of that hope for less severe outcomes with infectious disease physician, Dr. Alex Wong. Today we saw the results, Dr. Wong, of another study from the UK, this one from the country's health security agency, suggesting Omicron could produce fewer hospitalizations and other variants. It does come with some caveats, though. What should we make of this new data? Thanks, Asha. So the UK data released today would suggest uh, that there's about a 50 to 70 percent reduction in the risk of hospitalization with Omicron compared to Delta. And that mirrors the data that we've seen thus far from places like Scotland and South Africa. But as you say, there's a lot of caveats and it's still early times. There's only a small number of people in the UK who have been hospitalized. We haven't really had a chance to understand how those people hospitalized have been doing. Omicron has been spreading mostly in younger individuals in the UK, just like with South Africa. And we know those people are at lower risk of having bad outcomes to begin with. So we're going to get a better understanding of what Omicron is going to do with the elderly population as it begins to spread there. Lastly, it's causing a lot of reinfections, and that may also be a reason why there's less severe illness. So a lot of caveats, but honestly, it is reason for some hope. And, you know, what is the bottom line for people right before Christmas? There's still a lot of unknowns with Omicron, but we know it's super contagious, probably the most contagious respiratory virus with, since measles. So just be super careful this holiday season, please. Keep your bubbles tight. Keep your indoor gatherings small, five to ten people at most. Try to do the best you can with regards to doing as much as you can outdoors. Uh, and as I say, if you have the ability to do so, use your rapid tests as much as you can right before the gathering. Make certain that everybody is optimally vaccinated. And lastly, uh, you know, give props to all those public health people and uh, frontline healthcare workers uh, who are sacrificing their holiday season to help keep us safe and get those vaccines in arms. Happy holidays. 100%. Happy holidays to you too. Thanks, Dr. Wong. Take care. Turning now to other news, a virtual vigil was held tonight for Lee Marion Kane, the eight-year-old Nova Scotia boy who was killed in a shocking and tragic shooting. This would actually be a catalyst moment where we see this, this young child's life as a wake-up call to our community that we need to do better. Known to family as Marmar, Kane died in hospital on Tuesday after shots were fired at the vehicle he was in. A 26-year-old man in the same vehicle suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Investigators do not believe the shooting was random. There was relief and raw emotion outside a courtroom in Minnesota today as a former police officer was found guilty in the shooting death of Dante Wright. The shooting was captured on police body cam. It is important to note we'll be showing you some of the moments leading up to it. Katie Nicholson now with this story and the meaning some are finding in the verdict. We love you, Dante! Outside the courthouse, celebration and prayer. Lord, we thank you for your justice prevailed and reigned today. While inside, a somber verdict came down. We, the jury on the charge of manslaughter in the first degree, find the defendant guilty. Police body camera footage captured the last moments of 20-year-old Dante Wright's life. Okay, so you are gonna be under arrest, okay? The proud father of a toddler was driving to a car wash when police pulled him over because of expired tags and an air freshener dangling illegally from his rearview mirror. Do Police tried to arrest him because of an outstanding warrant, 
In the scuffle, veteran officer Kim Potter drew her gun taser, taser, taser. and shot right in the heart. I shot him! Oh my God! Potter said she thought it was her taser. I'm sorry it happened. For a while, it seemed the jury might be hung. They asked the judge what would happen if they couldn't reach a consensus. They asked to be able to see the gun for themselves, to judge whether this was an act of recklessness or a mistake. Their decision, a relief to Wright's mother. The moment that we heard guilty on the um, manslaughter one emotions, I kind of let out a yelp because it was built up in the anticipation of what was to come. Wright was killed just kilometers from the courthouse where Derek Chauvin was being tried in the murder of George Floyd. That case also ended with a former police officer being convicted. Minnesota's Attorney General says it signals change. But accountability is an important step, a critical, necessary step on the road to justice for us all. Kim Potter is now living with that accountability. She was denied bail and taken into custody to await sentencing in February. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Washington. As tensions rise at the Russian-Ukrainian border, Vladimir Putin turned up the pressure on the West in his year-end news conference. Murray Brewster looks at how the elevating tensions are putting Canada in a tough spot. For a brief moment, the clouds of war parted at Vladimir Putin's annual marathon news conference. He says he's optimistic about upcoming talks with the U.S. And the ball is in their court now and they should respond. A contrast to Wednesday, meeting with Russian generals where Putin said Russia will take adequate military and technical actions to respond to what it sees as an aggressive West. Technical actions have meant the continued buildup of more than 100,000 troops on Ukraine's border. Experts wonder whether that adequate military response actually includes a full-blown invasion. So I think the scenario of a massive invasion of Ukraine uh, is, is highly unlikely. If Putin has to take Kiev, he's lost the war because the, uh, the international response will be so devastating. A more likely scenario, an extension of the shadow war using Russian special forces, so-called little green men whose guerrilla tactics are deniable and were used in the takeover of Crimea in 2014. Canada has, since 2015, trained Ukrainian soldiers to counter those tactics. The Liberal government has signaled it intends to renew the Ukraine training mission when it expires in March. Russia has demanded all NATO forces leave Ukraine. In the event of hostilities, tough decisions will be necessary. We have trainers that are focused on just that training, not, uh, not fighting. And so, as with any, um, uh, any deteriorating situation, we would have to take a look at what that situation is and what we do with our force on the ground. Russia wants a neutral Ukraine on its border and has demanded the U.S. promise the country never be allowed to join NATO. That demand has been rejected outright. What happens next for Ukraine may depend on talks between Putin and the West. The White House today says no date has been set. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. A monument remembering victims of the Tiananmen Square massacre has been taken down in Hong Kong. It's really sad for, for seeing this happening. The Pillar of Shame was one of the few remaining public memorials in Hong Kong commemorating the bloody government crackdown of 1989. Global Affairs Canada called its removal deeply troubling, adding that events relating to Tiananmen Square will still be remembered here in Canada. Tonight, a special ad issue tackles the biggest political stories of the year. Two words, a uh, perfect storm. This was an utter catastrophe. It's been a very divisive year. But I think that is a good story that we're not paying enough attention to. Rosie and the team are next. Plus, the most powerful space telescope ever is ready to launch. We're going to see things that nobody expected. The Canadians excited to use it. I saw the title of the email and I was like, oh my god, I'm not physically or mentally prepared for that. And there are teachers, and then there's this teacher. <laughs> The story behind that legendary shot. We're back in two. The message is very, very clear. Stay home. It's not the time to travel. 
So Mr. Trudeau, show us the plan for these doses you've promised. This budget makes a historic investment in early learning and child care. What happened to Indigenous people and what, what, what has happened to Indigenous people in this country is genocide. Her Excellency, the Right Honourable Mary May Simon. The government and indeed Parliament needs an opportunity to get a mandate from Canadians. That was an attack for sure against Quebec. Come on, it's unacceptable. It has been the worst period in my life uh, in many respects. About 12 minutes ago, the aircraft carrying Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor left Chinese airspace and they're on their way home. The speech from the throne mentioned inflation once. British Columbia is in stress and in crisis as a result of successive weather events. I apologize to the thousands of Canadians who were harmed. The fact is that the Assemblée Nationale du Québec has full, entire, and legitimate jurisdiction over this issue. Incredibly, that was all just in the past year. Uh, if 2020 was unprecedented, well, let's just say that 2021 also saw, saw its fair share of crises from the pandemic, of course, to the changing climate, the Canadian military, and more. And hey, it was also an election year. So uh, time this it's that time where we look back on some of the political highs and lows and ahead to what next year in Canadian politics could bring. Here to do that, of course, with me is at issue Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, and Elamine Abdul-Mahmoud. Whenever uh, our, our lovely producer Ariel puts those packages together, my mind kind of explodes because I've forgotten half the things that have happened through the year. Um, Chantal, I'm going to start with you on this one. One word to describe the year in politics and why. I'm glad you're going to start with me because I'm going to start cheating. Uh, and then the others can also do the same thing. So I, I picked two words, uh, perfect storm. Uh, this uh, was the year when the pandemic obviously dominated uh, Canada in many more ways than one and defined, very much defined politics. But I, it was also the year when the impact of climate change, I think, really started to register for a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, because of the events, uh, in particular in BC, but not exclusively, uh, that kind of drew the pattern for the future. So yeah. combine those two and you have the ingredients of uh, two phenomenons that dominate politics, but that politicians have very little control over. Okay, Althea, will you also be a cheater? One word to describe politics. If I can cheat, I'd say Groundhog Day because <laughs> I feel like we're just exactly at the same spot that we were last year. We had a federal election with the same result and who knew Omicron was going to um, bring us to where we are now. Um, I feel like in some ways a lot has changed, but so much has not. And it yeah. kind of feels like we're in that... Bill Murray movie where you can't seem to get out of it. That was something people usually watch at this time of year. Uh, Andrew Coyne, one word for you, or two or four at this point. <laughs> well, Rosemary, as you know, I have no time for cheaters. Uh, so I have one word, and that word is stasis. So I'm sort of making a similar point to Althea. I mean, every year is eventful, but this was actually not that eventful. We were remained in the grip of, of this pandemic for most of the year, immobilized in various sorts of ways, including our politics. And yes, the election that was supposedly going to be the most important election since 1945, um, it didn't change anything, really. Okay, so, I mean, uh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Sorry, Andrew, to cut you off. Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. No, no I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Elamine, over <laughs> to you. I would say maybe the opposite, actually. The word for me for this year is probably nimble, in the sense that we've actually had to move through a bunch of different political seasons. Um, if you guys remember around, you know, January of this year, we were wondering when the shots were going to be in arms, you know, and whether the travel advisors would be lifted and people can travel again. And we're back in that place now, but we took quite a journey to get there. Um, you know, the world opened up. Um, we vaccinated a lot of this country, and then things started ratcheting up again, and then now we're back here. So I think politicians have had to have, have to maybe find a bunch of different modes to speak throughout this year. Um, so I would say you divide into a bunch of neat seasons. One is that stasis of the early this year, and then we had to go into an election season. Now we're back in the same place we were, but it, it required a lot of quick shifting on behalf of politicians anyway. 
Okay, time time is is moving quickly, so I'm going to skip to the third question. What was the, the with the third question? The greatest political challenge of the year, and because I cut you off, Andrew, you you start us off. <laughs> I think it's pretty clear that the pandemic, um, you know, it's partly the pandemic itself. It's partly the wave upon wave of misinformation and misunderstanding that's out there. And it's only compounded as the year wore on and supposedly we were all going to be out of it, you know, in three months or six months or nine months. And here we are still stuck in it. There's good reasons for that, but it's making it harder and harder, I think, to sustain public focus on this. Chantal, biggest challenge. There is no doubt it's the pandemic. It's unprecedented. Uh, it's open-ended. There is no playbook for it. And it is um, saving or uh, killing political leadership. Look at what happened to Jason Kenney over the past year, mostly pandemic-related. He is the most experienced uh, premier ba based on his federal experience. Look at what happened to Premier Ford in Ontario, who's not doing too badly and was really uh, the rookie uh, when he first came to power in Ontario. So it has changed the way, the conventional way where we assess politicians and some of them have lost their balance along the way. Althea. Same. I think vaccination probably was the greatest challenge of the year, if that was like the big thing going into 2021, um, which has been rather remarkable. But keeping ahead of the pandemic, I think, is the biggest challenge of 2021. Elamine. I guess uh, if we could drill more into that, it'd be sort of the way the pandemic altered the political leader's radar for what's more, for more, well, what's most important. Um, whether it's wanting to talk about the economy when people are really worried about vaccines or wanting to talk about inflation when people are really worried about whether schools are going to be open. Nobody seems to be, you know, hitting quite the perfect note in terms of what every Canadian is worried about. So it feels like all politicians are kind of flying blind. Okay, well, that brings me to the next question. Uh, you all sort of touched on in some ways, and that is who impressed you the most at any level with leadership? Elamine, you, you just ended, but why don't you start on that one? I mean, I have to say, you know, uh, it's the easy answer here, but I'm impressed most by the Prime Minister um, in terms of the way that he's navigated this year because he went into that election with very high polling numbers, um, and then they started to dip in a way that made a lot of us wonder whether this really could be the end. Um, and then by the end, he managed to sort of save his minority government and keep one. And I don't think that was, you know, I don't think that was a given or inevitable at all. So that was, for me, the, the political story of the year. Uh, Althea. Maybe this is a bit of a cheat, but I'm going to say nobody. Uh, this year marked me <laughs> by the fact that I feel like I I can't point to any particular political leader and say, wow, this person's leadership really marked me. Mm -hmm. And it's been a very divisive year in politics across Canada. Um, and so the pandemic has affected so many people in different ways and in ways that, frankly, were not the same ways that in 2020 affected them. So I feel like there's been a, a dearth, frankly, of political leadership. How about you, Chantal? I'm with Althea on this. Uh, I was trying, you know, going through the premiers, the prime minister, I, and the opposition leaders. There is a reason why Canadians re-elected just about the same House of Commons, and it's because nobody actually uh, upped his or her game in a way that would have made uh, people say, wow, this is who we want to, to look at. Uh, that, that's not to say that they did a bad job, but the, mm -hmm. the, the question is who impressed you most with yeah. the, his or her leadership? Not a year for that. Okay, Andrew, let's see if you can bring it home then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nova Scotia Premier Tim Houston. Uh, the Tories have been out of power since 2006. They've just, we've just seen four straight provincial elections where the incumbents were re-elected, the Tories were behind 20 points in the spring, they were behind 10 points when the election was called, and he pulled it out. It was very much a personal triumph, uh, both strategically and in terms of his own personal appeal. Yeah, I think he's the political winner of the year. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, which political story didn't get enough attention this year, Althea? I think the the healthcare system. We didn't I mean, we talk around the healthcare system and we talk about the problems in the healthcare system, but really, like, how do we get to this point and how do we fix it? How do we solve this problem looking 15, 20 years down the line? Because clearly we have a capacity problem that is causing all these lockdowns. How do we fix it? And I feel like we haven't really spoken about that at all. And we frankly, we should. Uh, Andrew, most uh, under-discussed political story. Uh, believe it or not, the Afghanistan disaster. We talked about it during the election for a few days, maybe a couple of weeks. 
uh, and then it kind of dropped off the map in terms of at least political discussion. This was an utter catastrophe, uh, not just for Afghanistan, but for the people that we had promised that we would look after. Uh, and they were basically thrown over the side, um, uh, whether because the government had other things on its mind, i.e. the election, or just because they hadn't planned enough for it. But the results are pretty shocking and still going on. Elamine. Uh, I think the most overlooked story is actually the, uh, it's a good story, which is like how good, how well the vaccine distribution is going in this country and the general uptake. We, as it turns out, we are a nation of rule followers. We like to get vaccines. We like to listen to um, what health officials are telling us to the point where we have some of the best sort of vaccine numbers um, in the world. And I think that is a good story that we're not paying enough attention to because, of course, there's other things to worry about. But I think when we look back at that, we're gonna, I think we're going to be proud of the fact that we're all sort of said, you know what, you need to take some vaccines. Sure, we're in. Absolutely. This is why I invite Elamine, because he does, he has a, a positive outlook once in a while. <laughs> Chantal, last word to you. I think it's only just now dawning on uh, a lot of Canadians, including observers, how the Canada-U.S. relationship is not going back to what many people considered uh, the normal. Uh, the post-Trump era is as challenging in many ways as the Trump era. Uh, with a possible new Trump era coming. I, I think while the story did get covered, it did not get the attention it would have gotten absent the pandemic. Okay, that's a good one too. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We will be back with more at issue and we will look at the political stories to watch coming up in 2022. Coming up with Chantal, Andrew, Althea and Elamine. <laughs> Welcome back to another round of that issue. We've been talking about the year in politics. Now, let's take some time to look ahead. Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, Elamine Abdul Mahmoud. Obviously, very much in flux the year ahead. So we'll try and make these questions kind of as general as possible. Let's start with the political leader or MP to watch in 2022. Althea. Aaron O'Toole, how long can he survive as leader of the Conservative Party with his caucus going in all sorts of direction? Um, and uh, a lack of, I would say, fear, respect, like, pick your word of choice um, from caucus. I think that is the most politically fascinating story at the moment. Elamine. Uh, mine's provincial, so Stephen Del Duca is the one that I'm interested in. I, how can how can the Ontario Liberal leader do in this upcoming um, provincial election? Um, you know, Doug Ford had all kinds of runway to sort of retell the story of how he handled the early days of COVID, um, but now the Omicron variant is here, and so he's up, you know, back again against the ropes, and uh, we'll see how Stephen Del Duca makes use of that. Okay, Chantal. Uh, it's related to Altia's. Uh... It sounded almost like a political death watch. Uh, so I'm going to watch uh, Pierre Poilievre, the finance critic uh, uh, of the Conservative Party. Why? Because when you look at the, the potential um, benefactors from a uh, possible O'Toole demise, his name comes first. And it looks from the outside like he's using his uh, finance critic position to actually campaign for the leadership. Andrew Coyne. Uh, Manitoba Premier Heather Stephenson. Uh, she came in with the Tories really back on, on their feet, uh, back on their back feet, I should say, after uh, uh, the, the you know, tumultuous regime of her predecessor. Uh, but she is, I think, a template perhaps for a more a moderate, contemplative kind of Tory leader uh, that I think people will be watching to see whether that can play with the grassroots and whether it can play with the general public. That's what happens when you have two Manitobans on a panel. Eventually, Manitoba comes <laughs> up. Uh, okay, a political story you'll be watching in 2022, Althea. Same answer as the one I just gave. <laughs> okay. You told us to it. be short on time. There we I go. I get it. There we go. Chantal, how about you? Um, no, for diversity, the Ontario and the Quebec elections, one in June, the other in September. And remember, at this point, both François Legault and Ford are ahead. So was Justin Trudeau this time last year. Good point, Andrew. I guess I'll put it in Aaron O'Toole here. You know, he had a couple of good weeks towards the end of the year, but he's by no means out of the woods. Uh, there's a large section of the party that's extremely angry with him, and they can make trouble in low level and high level ways for a long time to come. It's going to be a real sort of battle of attrition. Elamine. 
uh, the constant questions that uh, Justin Trudeau has had his last election. And so I'll be watching for Christopher Freeland. So just to see, you know, if she's in fact the heir apparent, um, how does she behave if she's being, you know, ready to take over the reins? So that's the thing to keep an eye on. Okay, last one on this uh, on this panel. The biggest political challenge for next year, Andrew. Uh, inflation. I knew you were uh, going to say it. I levels. could have guessed that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of a big issue. Uh, we haven't seen levels of inflation like this uh, for 30 or 40 years. We know from the past that it can absolutely overturn politics. Um, it is it, the single thing that you can that, that is most likely to wreck an economic recovery, uh, and if people have you know a great fear of it as well. So uh, we've let it get out of the the bag, and now we have to try and stuff it back in. Chantal. For different reasons, uh, economic policy at the federal level, not just for all the reasons Andrew uh, described, but also because, as uh, LMN pointed out, Christian Freeland, Pierre Poilievre, that's mm -hmm. where their sandbox is at this point. Uh, LMN, biggest political challenge? Uh, I think it's going to be trust in government, you know, trust in government um, and basically reliability. Like we are in a moment where, you know, the numbers for getting a, a booster shot are pretty low. Will the uptake continue to be as high um, now that we're asking people to get more of these shots? And also, will this be the last time that you're asking people to do that? And so I think trust in government after two years of having to sort of really work out that muscle might probably be beginning to atrophy. And Althea, last one to you. The pandemic. I feel like inflation and the economic maneuvering of the federal government all kind of will flow from what uh, what faces us in February, March, April, and then hopefully we are not back here again in December of 2022, because that would be really sad. I hope the same thing. All right. Thank you all. Chantal, Andrew, Althea, Elamine, that was a great conversation. Be well. Thank you. Uh, and I will, with that, send it back to Asha in Toronto. Thanks, Rosie. The most powerful telescope ever made is ready to blast off into space. It's going to be a new era in astrophysics. Next, the Canadians ready to explore galaxies far, far away. Plus. <laughs> the elementary teacher turned internet sensation. The story behind Ms. Fitz a little later. For more than three decades, the Hubble telescope has given us dazzling images from space. Not just pretty pictures, these are visions of remote galaxies, supernovas, and nebulas. And soon our vision of space is going to get even clearer. On Saturday, the super powerful James Webb Space Telescope is scheduled to launch. Jayla Bernstein now on why it's such a big deal and why for some Canadians, it's personal. Decades in the making, with a $10 billion price tag, a lot rides on the James Webb Space Telescope's success. It's going to be a new era in astrophysics. The successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, the Webb is 100 times more powerful. We're going to see things that nobody expected, and I think that's one of the, uh, one of the most exciting things about the mission. Two key components were Canadian-made, an instrument to study distant galaxies and a guidance sensor tested right here in this lab. It's been a great journey, uh, working with a great team. I, 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 yeah, I'm the maestro, but it's, it's so many people involved in this project. The telescope is like a time machine, able to see ancient light from billions of years ago. It won't see all the way back to the Big Bang, but NASA says it will observe the first galaxies that formed. While Hubble mainly observed light visible to the human eye, Webb will detect infrared light, allowing it to see farther and in more detail. We're building the most complex machine ever built by humanity, and we're sending it 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. It'll take a month to travel to its destination. Then the telescope's components will need to unfold and start calibrating. Data will finally start flowing six months later. Astronomer Olivia Lim will be studying a solar system 39 light years away. We don't know if those planets have an atmosphere or not. They may be balls of rock with no atmosphere at all. We don't know that, so we're, we're trying to figure it out. René Doyon encouraged her to submit a proposal to use the telescope. She did and was surprised to find out she'll get the most time with it of any Canadian. I saw the title of the email and I was like, oh my God, I'm not physically or mentally prepared for that. Started reading and then realized that our proposal was accepted. 
Her excitement, just one small example of what the scientific community is feeling ahead of the launch of the revolutionary James Webb Space Telescope. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. When we come back, the power of a Christmas carol in Cree. How one woman is using song to reclaim her traditional language with confidence and pride. But first. Today, Prince Harry and Meghan released their official Christmas card. It's the first photograph of daughter Lilibet to be made public. And with that hair, Archie has officially joined the Royal Redheads. Meanwhile, the Duchess of Cambridge has recorded a message of comfort to a nation reeling from a COVID surge. We've also realized how much we need each other and how acts of kindness and love can really bring us comfort and relief. Kate's message will be a part of a carol service at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Eve. As for the Queen, she'll be at Windsor Castle, where on Saturday she'll deliver her 69th Christmas speech. I'm Jamie Poisson. Join me for CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. Every weekday, Front Burner takes you deep into the story shaping Canada and the world. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Our next story brings new meaning to a simple Christmas carol with a Cree Métis woman in Saskatchewan who found singing them in Cree was a new way to showcase and share her identity. Bonnie Allen has the story. A Christmas carol in her traditional language of Cree performed with the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra. At center stage, Fallon Baptiste is confident and proud, but she didn't always feel this way. Baptiste grew up on Red Pheasant First Nation in Saskatchewan. By junior high, she had to bus off reserve to attend school in a nearby city. It was so clear as a 12-year-old girl that, all right, what, whomever you are is not okay. So we need to change who you are to fit in. I spent a large part of my life trying to prove to others that I wasn't First Nation, that I wasn't Indian. The exception was when she sang in Cree, especially Christmas carols. Eventually, she realized she needed to embrace the traditional language and culture in the rest of her life. So Baptiste learned to read, write and speak Cree fluently and started teaching Cree at a Saskatoon high school. Sometimes my dad is like surprised because like he knows he didn't teach me that. I get to learn for the children that never got to learn their language. There's almost a process of self-acceptance that has to take place and they're proud of who they are. They, they stand a little taller, they walk a little prouder down the hallway. <laughs> At home, Baptiste translates songs into Cree and records them. Earlier this year, she was going to release an album of religious songs, but stopped after the discovery of unidentified remains at former church-run residential schools. And so I stopped the project altogether, and I thought, no, this isn't the time for it. She doesn't feel the same about Cree carols. She says Christmas is a time to celebrate the creator, community and culture. And for her to stand tall. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. Up next on The National, what happens when your teacher is also a baller? So cool. The story behind this incredible moment right after this. Kawhi up top, looks at the clock, turns the corner for the win! Okay, we bet you remember this glorious buzzer-beating shot by Kawhi Leonard in 2019. It's what sent the Raptors to the Eastern Conference Final, of course, and to eventually win that NBA championship. Now, if you thought that was the shot of the century, well, wait until you see what a third grade teacher managed to pull off to fulfill a very special promise for her students. That's our moment tonight. <laughs> Kathleen Fitzpatrick, or as her third grade students in DC call her, Miss Fitz, 
is the latest internet sensation after scoring this impressive bucket on the line for her students, a promise of hot chocolate at class. And boy, did she have to deliver after that shot. It got a lot of attention online from former NBA players to the White House press secretary. But let's have a look at the video again. In case you didn't notice from that follow through, Miss Fitz was already a baller. She played for Rutgers University where a director tweeted another impressive video. She's been doing this, he wrote. Only thing new is someone's calling her Ms. Fitz. Can't get enough of that. Tens of thousands of people have watched the video so far and counting. Ms. Fitz has been doing a bunch of interviews and was even surprised during one of them by Raptors legend, Vince Carter. Doesn't get better than that. That is The National for December 23rd. I'm Ashton Tomlinson. Good night.